Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The Death Star is the physical manifestation of everything wrong with the Galactic Empire. A massive concentration of political and economic power in the hands of one individual which is expended in pursuit of a moon-sized vanity project that does nothing but destroy. You know what would have been a billion times cheaper than building a Death Star and still capable of striking fear into the hearts of the enemies of the Empire? A massive tractor beam that essentially drags asteroids into planets. That's how the Yuzhang Vong killed Chewie. It's a really smart solution for a really stupid thing that I don't understand why the Empire is trying to do in the first place. Like, why are we destroying entire worlds of resources when we can conquer them? And more importantly, the Death Star, because of its sheer size and mass, has a lot of constraints from a physics point of view and a material science point of view that I think are really interesting to take a look at because they, they have to figure out some kind of artificial systems that maintain a structure this size. And so hopefully before the end of this video, you're gonna realize that the Rebels didn't actually need to do the whole trench run and shoot a proton torpedo down the chute maneuver to destroy the Death Star. There's actually another very essential system uh, that keeps this whole structure intact. And had they just sabotaged that, I think it would have been enough to destroy the entire thing. Let's start with the main attraction, the Death Star Super Laser. This thing is insane. The entire Rogue One universe and Andor were basically created specifically to explain the Imperial struggle to develop this specific terror weapon and the Rebellion's effort to discover and stop it. You see, building a moon-sized structure is quite difficult. I don't think this has ever been done in, in recent history in Star Wars, but it's also a relatively straightforward process that just involves a lot of math and calculations. It's a lot less complicated than designing the main super weapon. Something that took Galen Erso decades of research and development starting all the way back during the Republic era. The concept here is to use a kyber crystal to amplify the energy from a hypermatter reactor. The kyber crystal has a unique property that allows it to amplify power. That's basically how a lightsaber works. You take a relatively small and simple battery source and the kyber crystal turns it into a molten hot beam of energy that can cut through dura steel and non-plot essential dialogue. Scaled up, this weapon in A New Hope can fire a single beam that obliterates Alderaan, an Earth-sized planet, in one clean shot. To do that in real life, you'd need around 2.2 times 10 to the 32 joules of energy. That's a billion times more energy than the output of the sun per second. That's more energy than every nuclear weapon detonated on Earth multiplied by trillions. That's very different from my tractor beam asteroid idea, which would still be devastating for the people living on the surface of the planet, but actually the planet itself would stay intact. A small percentage of material would be ejected outside of the orbit of the planet, but most of it would form into like a, a debris cloud and eventually fall back onto the planet. Even if there is a huge gouge in the planet from the collision, eventually gravity will smooth things over and turn the planet back into a ball. That's just how the physics works. So the 2.2 times 10 to the 32 power joule energy number that I came up with, that's actually a number called the uh, binding energy that holds a planet together. As in, that's how much energy you need to make sure that that planet never comes back together uh, from its gravitational force. That takes a lot of energy. Everything from the smallest particles have a binding energy point. For instance, atoms have a binding energy point, and it became very uh, important to know that when developing the Manhattan Project, which involves, of course, splitting an atom. So actually, now that I think about it, you know, firing one reactor like what Tarkin did on Jetta and also Scarif is usually enough to really just get rid of your enemies. Like, using all the reactors like he did during Alderaan was just... Complete overkill, and I guess that was designed really to send a message more than anything. They're not just wiping out all the people on the surface of the planet, they're, they're taking everything out, every little particle. But here's the thing, the Alderaan event is just way too clean looking and abrupt. That could be just the limitations of technology at the time. When in reality, if you actually have enough power to break the binding energy point of a planet, the, the destruction is going to be a lot slower looking, and it's going to be a lot more chaotic and random. Based on simulations, uneven fragments are going to be thrown in every direction based on the density of the material beneath the crust, right? You're not going to have uniform density in material, and so, like, certain areas will fly off first and certain areas will fly off second, and eventually you'll get this very chaotic-looking debris field, which is just a giant cloud that continues to expand. And again, this process would have to be very, very slow because we're talking about huge amounts of material uh, moving and shifting. I mean, they're still going to be moving very, very fast at lethal rates, but because of the sheer size of everything, it wouldn't just happen in a split second like it does 
in A New Hope. Now, if you're on the surface or in an airplane or something, the first thing you would see would be the oceans boiling uh, when the beam strikes the ocean and be a huge cloud of vapor. And then, of course, the crust would eventually crack apart. And then finally, small pieces of the crust would rocket into orbit sent by the immense force of that weapon. You definitely wouldn't get a clean explosion in that like kind of ring effect going around. It just wouldn't be like that. On a side note, three weeks after the destruction of Alderaan, Princess Leia and Luke were resting in some field in a star system many light years away from Alderaan. They were looking at the stars in the night sky, and it turns out where they were in the galaxy, it was so far from Alderaan that Alderaan's star was still visible. And it prompts Leia to wonder if she could just kind of go there. Of course, what really happened is, you know, Star Wars faster than light speed travel is many times faster than the speed of light. And so she simply has arrived onto this planet with news of the destruction of Alderaan before the light source actually got there. And this really shows you just how massive the Star Wars galaxy is. Oftentimes we don't think about that because they are beaming from one place to another. They're like cutscenes, basically. But yeah, you're traveling immense, immense distances. The first Death Star was around 160 kilometers wide. It's simply absurd how large a construction this is. The sheer amount of building material and manpower needed to construct something this large would have probably redirected so much traffic from the galactic supply chains that someone would have to notice, right? Like if you're a commodities trader, or if you're simply just trying to build a house, uh, you know, a quadrillion tons of Durasteel just disappearing from the supply chains is going to affect price, availability, all sorts of kind of crazy stuff. In a free market, all the materials the Death Star used, all the labor, you know, that would have attracted a lot of attention. It would have been a clear sign that someone was doing something crazy. Of course, this is why Palpatine really likes a control-style economy, where he can fudge numbers, uh, fudge output, so that no one knows what is actually going on. It's estimated that even built with some fictional lightweight alloy, a structure of this size will weigh way over a quadrillion kilograms or about the weight of 200 Mount Everest. When you have something that large in space, it, it's going to have gravitational pull. Uh, you know, it's kind of insane. And remember, the Death Star isn't a solid block of dark creed. That would be far too resource intensive to do, which is why Starkiller Base's method of construction where you use an existing moon to build your super weapon inside of is probably a far better option than building a hollowed out structure like a Death Star. Now, if the Death Star were built out of good old Earth steel, first of all, it would completely collapse, but it would also cost the equivalent of all steel production on this planet from Australia to Canada over the next million years. Another way of looking at this is that the Death Star probably used more metal than there is in Earth's crust. So again, it's a huge operation. You do need a galaxy-wide civilization to provide all of these materials. Now, let's say Durasteel is much lighter and stronger than, I don't know, like titanium. Let's say you have a ton of this material and you construct some kind of honeycomb structure to keep everything kind of okay, you're still going to have major problems, right? This isn't just a building or a space station that floats around. This thing is designed for deep space flights and has engines and hyperdrive. This means far more stress from acceleration and deceleration is going to be applied to this structure. And so even if you were to build an extremely strong internal structure, I imagine the real reason why the Death Star works and doesn't just collapse is because of the artificial gravity that this massive station generates. I think this is the only way you keep the Death Star functional. You need a ton of inertial compensator machines that are all kind of pushing outwards on the various deck plates that are being kind of pushed in because of all of the gravity and mass. You could technically place these anti-gravity or counter-gravity fields in specific points where you have more load-bearing structures. The same anti-gravity system would have to be used to prevent shocks from, again, really fast acceleration or you know slowing down, or even the main weapon firing can put a lot of stress on the entire structure. So you use these gravity fields to do everything, basically. I mean, heck, if you were a real degenerate, you could even, I don't know, remove like a percentage of the load-bearing beams for the Death Star and pocket the money for yourself and use those inertial dampeners to do all the heavy lifting. After which, you could probably find yourself a contracting job with Boeing to help them save costs. Very plausible considering the rampant corruption that the Empire faced. At the same time, there were probably other artificial gravity generators located on each deck, which simulates a 1G so that people can walk around normally and preserve their bone mass. These forces would actually counteract against the other forces that are keeping the structure of the Death Star intact. So again, this, this would have to be a very complicated system with a lot of different, um, I guess, like generators 
at strategic points. I imagine this was not a perfect system and that it wasn't uncommon for people to experience big gravity shifts from room to room. If the engineers aren't careful and they design things wrong, you could totally walk into a situation where your body gets ripped apart or you get kind of crushed by too much gravitational forces, especially if like they just made the entire Death Star have like 1G all throughout. That would create a lot of problems, I think. More importantly, you know those shots of the Death Star over Scarif? Well, that wouldn't have been a good idea. The Death Star is large enough to significantly affect other celestial bodies that draws near it. And so if the Death Star actually appeared in low orbit like it does over Scarif, which should be happening in those beautiful atolls is a massive tidal bolt that submerges everything under water. Even though the Death Star is a lot smaller than our moon, because it's so close, I mean, the gravitational forces would be really bad for the local area where it's over. There's even a possibility that plate tectonics could be disrupted by that kind of low flight. And if you're not careful, let's say the engines cut out or the reactor cuts out just for a second and you lose thrust, just like that Super Star Destroyer um, over Endor, then the entire Death Star will start deorbiting. And you know, at that point, you, you might as well abandon ship because you're not gonna recover that. So as you can see, the, the size of the Death Star is one of its biggest weaknesses. It's not just because of its costs or the, the maintenance is required to operate something like this. It's really the physics here. I mean, unless you have an object that's solid and this size, it's just gonna be extremely fragile. You're gonna need a lot of secondary systems working full time to make sure that this thing doesn't just collapse in on itself. If I'm a rebel, I think the best way to really destroy the Death Star is to somehow disrupt the power source or specifically find where the anti-gravity uh, generators are. You don't need to take out all of them. If you just take out one and that creates an imbalance, the whole thing should cascade and fail. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.